Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 66 of Get Out of Rap. My good friend, Pete Dunn, is joining me, who is representing, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, he's wearing the Get Out of Rap t-shirt, available at all good Redbubble outlets. <laughs> um, today, in our series of help, hopefully all podcast episodes are helpful, but we're just going to dive straight into a topic or rather, we're going to dive into the giant brain, rummage around in the brain of Peter Dan. Peter, mate! <laughs> we, uh, the first podcast I did with you, you're right, mate, by the way, the first podcast, podcast I did with you was a bit of a rummage around in my brain, wasn't it? Um, I'm considerably less stressed this time, though. That's... That's a year ago, over a year ago now, isn't it? So, and the reason for your stress at the time? The imminent arrival of my youngest son, Flynn Orion, who is now a year old. It's gone like that. Ta -da! <laughs> so, yeah, pre parenthood jitters that nerves that we all get actually there was a good podcast you're too you're too hard on yourself um one thing that is missing today because me and pete talk most days um is pete had a giant number one balloon <laughs> behind him with other balloons attached at the base of the number one um it's all multicolored. it's very very colorful before i digress even further <laughs> <laughs> and lose everyone because you're meant to be get to the point in the first minute what i like to do with this podcast especially when i'm talking to you pete is just forget all the well-established norms that make it a success <laughs> and just freestyle happy days <laughs> so today though we're talking about a key area of uh, quality a key area of any contact center not just specific to quality and that is the scorecards and um, when you think about it, I guess for some people, scorecards would be how QA is represented for them. That's the most obvious embodiment of what a QA team does, right? Yeah, absolutely. If the, the scorecard in, in so many instances is, is the vehicle for the feedback, you know, uh, whether it's it's it is feedback in a, in, a, in a push sense of this is your score, this is what you did wrong, um, or you know, hopefully better yet, here's here's a balanced view of you know these are your development areas, uh, these are your areas of strength kind of thing. But yeah, so often it's that here's the scorecard, the scoring standard, this is how you did against it, and that's that's that conduit from from QA into the operation, whether it's a specialised QA team. Or the team leader with their QA hat on, it's yeah, it's very much the, as you say, that that kind of representative thing that that sits above everything else a lot of the time, yeah. And I guess it comes down to that old adage: if you don't measure it, it's not going to happen. Is that if you've got um, no QA function, is the scorecard the very first thing that you do? or de de developing a scorecard, it, would that be task one? If you have, you go into a contact center right now, it has no quality framework or quality activity. Where does the scorecard sit in your seven days of creation list? Um, well, so I guess that another, I'm probably paraphrasing this badly, uh, is, is what is, if you've got an, an hour left to save the world, whatever it is, you spend 59 minutes planning and, and one minute implementing, um, it would sit at the end of the seven days. But it is, it is one of the key things to, to pull out from um, any kind of consultancy or exploration of, of building a quality assurance framework, uh, because it, it, as you said, before it's, it's the thing that links it all together now it might be the bad thing um that links it all together in pre-existing companies we see that so often it's it is it's the statue that's used to beat people you know 
it's the stick as opposed to the carrot, but it is the single best vehicle you can get at the same time to be positive. So it can it can contain all of your brand standards or, or your critical behaviors or the key things you need to see in each and every interaction between the face, the voice of your business and your customers. It's the thing that then allows you to understand if it's working well, allows you to understand are those things happening each and every day in each and every single interaction that you were sure? Um, realistically, do you QA everything? No, but you know, your agents, your advisors listen to everything. And if they understand your scorecard and your scoring standards, then they have a much better idea of, you know, uh, what they should be doing. It's that document that can contain that kind of Bible, that playbook, that the key things that outline what good looks like for each and every interaction and allows you then to, to check, are the right things happening? If you're looking at around an adherence scorecard or if it's more around your outcomes, then are the specialists who are using that scorecard to assure everything, are they telling the individual Again, you know, these are the areas you can get even better. These are the areas you're already strong. So it's about empowerment and development as well. So it's, it's really high on the list in terms of one of the key things that you want to get out of any kind of exploration of, of building a quality model framework. I love that. Um, I've experienced it firsthand, but also seen it um, subsequently quite often where for a lot of new starters, and I, I would say less so now, um, but for a lot of new starters that were frontline advisors, and like I say, my own experience, albeit this was a long time ago on the phones, um, the scorecard was given to me as pretty much the only real practical training guide in terms of how do I do my job, right? People gave you the scorecard and said, when you're talking to the customers, uh, initially for me it was sales, but then service, when you are going through a sale, let's say, this is how you, this is what you're going to be marked against. And bearing in mind it was done in the order of how they wanted the call to go or how it should progress, it was also your call guide. So often one document, as you say, was here you go. So how do I do the job? Read this follow it you can't go far wrong and obviously i'd like to think that um our inductions and our training and all of that stuff in our industry is far more evolved than what it was some um, 20 years ago but i think it i'm only raising that because it points to the importance of of the scorecard absolutely i think um i mean I would like to think that we've moved on from there too. And in, but in many instances, we still see, you know, and, and the, the podcast name is an example that some of those kind of legacy behaviors are still absolutely prevalent in, in the industry. Don't go after the name. <laughs> um, it's a positive. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you It's true, though. I know what you're saying. We've come a very long way, or we hope we have around professionalizing and empowering and building kind of clear progression opportunities for agents. But yeah, as you say, all too often, you can still almost say one of the key things that someone is given that kind of says, these are the things that you need to do is a scorecard and the scoring standards. And unfortunately, all too often, because as ever you have that, that gap between what is known and what is understood and then what is done because the person who maybe created a scorecard or the per or the people who helped build it are long gone or doing that's whatever else or it hasn't been reviewed you get that, that lowest common denominator thing of here's the here's the scorecard here's the standards here's the cheat sheet of how to score well on that scorecard where that that scorecard might not represent or and probably hasn't maybe for two three years in some instances we've seen before represented what the actual interaction requirement between the agent and the customer is you know and that's that's one of the key things that you 
you really need to to make sure that it does is that if you've got a, if you're building a scorecard and you go from scratch to your point you, you need it to capture what matters so it needs to align to if you've got strategic outcome you know we want to be number one for customer experience by let's say 2025 or whatever your high level strategic strap line might be then it, it needs to it needs to inform that because otherwise it will just always devolve into this is how you score well on a scorecard and it won't bear any resemblance to to real life so where what should people be doing now that are listening who um when it comes to the topic of scorecards where do you start with them what's your first what's your first tip uh, there were a couple there by the way um the big one being make sure it's aligned to your strategic goal right which is massively important um what where next what let's let's hit them with some tips peter hit them with some hot tips <laughs> um <laughs> I would, I would say you've almost got to ask the question of, well, maybe you've already answered it because you're doing this exploratory work, but why are you QAing at all? Um, so why are you actually doing this activity? Um, and that should then, if you don't have a clear, either a problem statement or better yet, an opportunity statement, you know, these are the things that are happening and this is what we want to do about it. So try and get it into that actionable opportunity statement. Why are we QAing? Well, there's clearly, a requirement because either the customers are saying that the service is terrible or the business thinks, well, we're spending loads of money on this, that, and the other. And so you have some clear objectives that you want to for sure. Um, and actually, as an aside, if you, if you look at quality assurance, you go back hundreds of thousands of years, well, not hundreds, thousands of years to what, um, what was it, Sumerian culture where they, you know, they carve stuff in stone and it's 6,000 BC and, and they had a QA process for the quality of products and the weights of products. So it's clearly been important for a very, very long time that you understand uh, the value of, of a thing and then that is, is checked to make yeah. sure that value continues to happen. Um, so, yeah, what do you want to score with scorecard? What, what does it measure? You have to define that very clearly. What does it measure and what outcomes do you want it to drive as a result? So if you have a very adherence heavy scorecard, lots of yes, no's for regulatory or legal issues or, or process adherence, then you're going to get a lot of detail around your systems, your processes um, and your interactions. So if, if you put in there, you know, soft skills, um, listening and questioning skills, uh, empathy and sympathy and so on. And again, if it's very tick box, you're going to get a lot of, of detail out the back of it. If you want it to be more outcome focused and it's very much around advisor development, then those outcomes that you want is that it captures a lot of commentary that says, you know, you did these things really well, but you could talk about this thing better. You could empathize more closely here. And then it's, it's around advisor development and empowerment. Um, you don't have to be either or, of course, but if your business uh, wants better interactions, then you're probably be better looking at how to improve the interactions by empowering your agents as opposed to, are they following the right process? If your business is really complex and you've got a lot of really complex processes that have to happen the right way at the right time, then have a scorecard that reflects that because uh, QA is a support function. QA exists to assure the product that it's been delivered by the operation. And if it doesn't align to it, then QA isn't delivering the value that it could. Are there any um, hard and fast rules around number of things you should measure? How, how, many, how many line items is considered normal in a scorecard? <laughs> I, would, I would say no um, and I base that on I don't even know how many conversations I've had around that it, 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 it goes hand in hand with what's the right number of valuations you know mm. and, and that there's so many variables I would say complexity should be aligned to complexity 
if you've got a very lightweight process, let's say you're in, you're in fast moving commercial goods, you're online company, um, places like ASOS, Boo Boo and so on, come on, you know, come to mind rather. And you want a lightweight scorecard that allows you to very quickly score the key things that matter to the customer, to the business, to give you that balance. If you're in finance, and you have a lot of, of complex requirements in place that you have to adhere to, it's not, they're not nice to have, then your scorecard should reflect that, you know? So unfortunately not. It's overall, it's complexity to complexity, as I would say. And if you do have, you know, hundreds of tick boxes on a scorecard for something that, that doesn't need it, then um, to make it better, you've got to take stuff out. And do you think that that's something that, in your experience, people have not done as much of? So when you, what's the, what's a normal scorecard look like when you pick it up, when you go into a company um, and you say, can I have a look at your scorecard? What, what are some of the common things that you, that you see? Yeah, um, I suppose the, the standard scorecard is generally going to have, you're going to have a soft skill section where you're talking about your know, pace, pitch, and tone, you're talking about you know empathy and sympathy, and you might then have a more technical section when you, that's looking at adherence, it's looking at questioning skills, um, and kind of have they rounded out on 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 the the customer's core issue and responded accordingly. And you'll probably have a compliance section, you know, which which is is normally tick box around. These are the regulatory, these are the, these are the legal requirements. GDPR, of course, being the biggie across, every, you know, pretty much every contact mm. center going inbound, outbound, sales, service, whatever it might be. Is there's GDPR? There's uh, you might have treat customers fairly or know your customer or whichever particular, you know, vulnerable customers, of course, in there as well. So that's the kind of three sections that we see a lot in in terms of 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 what I term a kind of flow scorecard um but the soft skills section almost always starting with you know the opening the greeting going through the meeting the call through to the the close you know did they offer anything else kind of thing um some places have a more holistic view so i know you know obviously bpa with a lot of our kind of more progressive clients we asked that wider arching question of was that a good quality you know good experience on balance kind of thing um but that's quite a bit more progressive in many instances than we see in in most companies do you um i'm just thinking about people that have got scorecards where maybe there's no regular reviews they've kind of organically organically grown do you have any advice for the regularity of reviews who should be involved um what people should be reviewing with their scorecards? Um, I guess well, three parts of that. Um, the frequency of review, I think, is defined almost by uh, change in strategic direction within the business. So if you've stuck with the same brand standards and behaviours for the past 10 years, I'd say chances are, actually, your business is probably not performing and delivering the kind of customer experience and, and return on investment outcomes that you want as a business, that's as an aside, um, your scorecard should absolutely move every time your focus areas move. And I say I say scorecard, don't curtail yourself to one scorecard. If you want to, to go back to our, the first podcast we did, a, a random sampling scorecard that covers a lot of your inbound calls, cool fantastic it's useful but it's more useful again to have a scorecard that might do your complaints or it might do escalation it might do sales opportunities and conversion and all of those scorecards should then be reviewed regularly to the second point with the individuals who use it and more importantly still the individuals who are scored against it so um, they need to understand that it, it's not being done to them you know qa is not the business prevention police. QA is, is, is an enabler, a supporter to deliver better 
outcomes for the customer and the business when done well. So that needs to be regular reviews with the individuals who are being scored against that card, understanding the standards at a level where um, they've had involvement. So I would always recommend you, you workshop with all those different groups to build that scorecard, you know, and, and don't be afraid to say no as well, because there's always some parts of the business who know they're going to get value from a scorecard. But if, let's say, marketing turn up and go, oh, can you capture some of these details about new products? Sometimes you've got to say no to stuff like that, because suddenly, again, that scorecard is going to just keep growing and growing and growing, and you'll lose sight of why you built it in the first place. So having a tight remit with regular aligned to business change reviews with the people who use it and the people who are scored on it, and that's the kind of key to ensure that your scorecard is, is valued, is aligned to your business outcome requirements and remains aligned to that. Nice. Where do you stand? I want to talk about scoring within the scorecard. Mm -hmm. um, what's your preference? An outcome, a percentage, pass fail? Um, the third one, I don't like, I don't like using the term fail when it comes to, to coaching, because you can't have an open and honest two-way conversation when you start it off by saying, these are the places you failed. You know, that, that just automatically causes more tension than, than you should you know, be happy to live with in that conversation. I would say strengths and opportunities, use positive language, be open and honest. Everyone makes mistakes, absolutely. We are human, you know, when the machines take over, it'll make mistakes too, because it was programmed by humans, you know, until Skynet arrives and we all die at the <laughs> fiery hand of Terminators. I'm, I'm um, relying on you coming back because you've, you're from the future. <laughs> too stuck into this, I get confused. Um, but I am heavily reliant on you coming to save the day, Peter. I'll give, I'll, I'll give it a go, mate. Um, it's, um, what was the question again? I got, I got so, Sorry. <laughs> you got distracted by Terminator. Yeah. Um, pass or fail, uh, uh, outcome so meets expectations, doesn't, or percentage, you deal with all of them. Do you have a, a particular preference? Um, I, I think the, the, the best outcome from a scorecard is when it's, it's a little bit of, of everything but it's all for value output. So percentages is useful for, for, the, for the business um, to understand that they're, you know, in an interaction, we maybe said a 95% standard is required, or we've set a zero tolerance on our regulatory requirements. How are we doing against those numbers? Because that then makes sense when it's put against other KPIs, you know? Um, when it comes to the individual that it's, it's supporting, um, I much prefer narrative outcomes because um, generally we don't talk numbers all day. We, you know, our, our language is not, you know, beeps and whistles and binary. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's complex interaction. I wish it was, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> It'd be a lot more efficient, right? Beeps and whistles. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I would say if you start if you start to use language like you know this is a strength this is an opportunity this is where you've met something this is where you've exceeded something and this is how this is why you can get better that kind of narrative outcome is 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 much more useful in an operation in terms of allowing for effective converse, coaching and development conversations to happen telling someone they scored ninety percent and they should have got ninety five percent. Well, where's the other five percent come from? You know, and actually, is that the same five percent each and every time? It's very unlikely, unless they have a single systemic issue that's stopping them from achieving quality. And if someone scores ninety-five percent, then they're happy. Well, in a narrative conversation, you're more likely to actually drive someone towards the hundred percent, the perfect core, because it is achievable. You're not setting standards that that almost seem impossible for the business, as I say percentages 
if you measure kind of process adherence areas and understand that you're not going to manage individuals against percentages you're going to manage improvement opportunity so if you can see that certain parts of your processes have huge gaps or, or are problematic you can understand is, is there a training requirement is there a system change requirement is there a process change requirement it's you can use all of the above apart from fail i don't like fail um it's more important about what you do with the with, with, with what you're capturing because if you've got 95 percent as a target and you get close and you color it in yellow and stick it in a little box in a dashboard without any context then it's just a number you know and or if you say well everyone's meeting and that's fine and you color it yellow in a box because you want exceeded more often again you kind of lost your way so the outcome needs to be it's generating insight that allows you to positively transform your agents and your operational activity and your strategic outcomes. And do they, is it a good idea when you're reviewing your own scorecard to think about that? So is the output of this scorecard allowing me to make an agent better, make the experience better, or make our processes better. If you if you review your scorecard against those three things, um, because it may be doing what one of those, but not the other two, right? Absolutely. Um, theoretically, if you've got those three kind of broad pillars and it's doing one really really well and it's having a fantastic outcome, and you need to step back from that to strengthen the other two. It's always the question of well, should you? You know, balance is is good, but if you're getting fantastic outcomes as a result, then maybe you don't need to review. Um, I, I would say it's it's always useful when you're doing a review to kind of you step into the shoes of your of your customer, um, step into the shoes of, of, of your your frontline agent. And then let's say a, a senior manager within the business, just as some broad personas, and kind of go um, and ask yourself the question is, oh, well, so, you know, so what does this mean for the customer? You know, very much the so what um, on, on, we want to add all of this stuff in, well, so what for a customer? Because if they don't care, because it's nothing to do with getting a better outcome for a customer, well, so what for the business? You know, and if, if it doesn't drive any business outcomes, then you're kind of at a point where you're thinking, well, so what for the agent? We've got that you know, doesn't really change anything for the agent. That's the point where you can't kind of say, well, why are we even doing it? You know, because that's always part of the challenge is not doing something as well and understanding the why of, of why you've not got in that in a scorecard. To my early point around marketing if marketing want a load of kind of in-depth detail around products and services that they might help them to generate new markets or new content or whatever if it's not helping the customer and it's not helping the business much and it's definitely not helping the agent and sometimes you just got to say no we don't want that in the scorecard yeah that makes a lot of sense one of the things that um, I know challenges operations and QA and sometimes the relationship between them is that the, the scorecards, the, 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 bat, the kind of battleground, because um, whether it's human nature or you mentioned something earlier around, and it just prompted me to remember uh, you know, as an agent or then as a team leader delivering QA's feedback or doing QA myself, you're, when you deliver something, you might have a scorecard that you've assessed a call um, and it is brilliant. But there's a couple of things or maybe one thing where something could have been done slightly better. No, no one's perfect. Um, human nature, both as a kind of recipient or also the person delivering and expecting it, people zero in on that don't they people will go why did my what i didn't do well here why is that 
Um, and then those are the areas where QA and ops will sometimes have to go backwards and forwards. Is that just to be accepted? Is there any way that that can um, be addressed? Well, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it, it is something that, yeah, human nature does hold in on, on exception. Um, th there's always a need, I think, to provide yeah, that balanced view. Th these are your strengths uh, because otherwise, yeah, your coaching conversation is, is just driven by the negative. And, and that, that just shuts people down, disengages them, makes it just really difficult to, to have a conversation where you want the outcomes to be that they feel heard, understood and empowered to, to do better, to be able to embrace the opportunity to do better at their role because they've been given some very clear areas of development. Um, those conversations are inevitable, I would say. Um, even even in the most kind of advanced setups that I've seen over the last I don't know fifteen so years uh, of of you know quality um, in contact centres, I, I would say I've maybe seen two or three where that friction between support functions, so not just QA of course, but planning, insight, etc. as well, and the operation hasn't existed. You know, and that's like I say, it's, it's less than I can count on one hand in I don't know how many hundreds of contact centers I've, I've, I've seen and, and worked with and so on. With that in mind, I think you just have to accept that it's going to happen. It can instance. be positive as well, though, can't it? It could yeah, absolutely. that I think the absence of that would be weird um, because in that kind of you can get creative. I guess by having proper conversations and the scorecards can allow for that to be the place where you have those conversations about is this really driving the right advisor behavior that we that we want and and it's in the gray isn't it it's kind of people getting into semantics and and things like that especially if there's like financial implications involved absolutely uh, yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's encourage it, explore it, use your review slash dispute slash escalation, whatever kind of process you might want to term it. Have a formal process that allows frequent discussion around the scoring standards. And you know, um, Helen did a fantastic podcast with you on on calibration. That, couple that with scorecards is it's a fantastic mechanism to allow everyone to understand why something is scored the way it is especially for advisors you say if they don't understand the impact of not adhering to a particular part of the scorecard then they're far less likely to to know why it matters and why they should do it and those are the conversations you can have that allows that communication to flow out into the operation and say you know they're not QA standards they're the, they're the standards for the business and this is why and if you disagree call tell us and we will work together to to make sure that either we change it because it's not right or you understand why it is right so you don't have those objections anymore and then you can build a clear path on how you deliver to that standard knowing uh, why it's scored the way it is. That's a really good point. I love, I love the idea of um, the scoring standards, and I'll, touch, I'll ask you something about that in a second, um, but the scoring standards having, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I understood here was you said to explain, to, to demonstrate, to show people why not hitting a particular standard what impact that has on the customer because then it's less about enforcing nonsensical rules for the sake of it it's more it, it should give people comfort the reason we do this is because the customer benefits by us doing it so the absence of it we have to try and minimize absolutely yeah and Businesses don't just struggle with that at, at the advisor level. 
very often we struggle at all levels to understand um, the avoidance of a fine because of the QA um, and compliance assurance processes that are in place. Um, so it's difficult to say we didn't get fined 10 million there because you know everyone understands why they should do stuff or not do stuff you know when it comes to breaching as it were or, or taking risks um, and all of that again allows you to develop a more robust and more codified kind of set of policies processes and procedures from a QA perspective being able to have the conversations determine the impact for the business uh, for the advisor and as you say, most specifically for the customer, then allows you to, to say, oh, if you don't do this, this is what happens. If you do, this is what happens. That's what it means for, for everyone involved in this ongoing relationship. Um, this is what it means if it doesn't happen. And then again, it, it's just there for everyone to, to see, to, to understand, to challenge, to, and, to, and to build and improve upon. That's great. And the question I was going to ask you is, I've got so people that have got their scorecards that they're starting to regularly update, make sure they're aligned with their strategic um, goals, that the outcomes lend themselves to driving the right behaviours across different demographic groups, agents, customers, and the kind of process. Um, something you mentioned, when you say scoring standards, yeah. is that uh, the guidelines around how an out a line item can be scored. Absolutely, yeah. So that's yeah one of one of many terms. That's the one I I use the most. Of scoring standards, yeah. So if you get a yes, this is what it means. This is what you've done to ensure that you've got that. You get a no, this is what it means. This is what you've not done to ensure that. Each part of your scorecard can absolutely be outlined um, in as much depth for complex scorecards or not for lightweight scorecards as is required so it's understood by everyone that looks at it um because realistically at some point your senior leadership team is going to want to to understand what is being driven by what's being measured you know uh, to your point you know that that which is Measured matters, I think is the other Peter Drucker quote is. Um, you remembered who said it. I mean, I mangled it. <laughs> <laughs> but you prompted me. Um, <laughs> it's 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 um, it's not always the case that, that you know only that that which is measured matters. A lot of the time, you can't measure what matters to follow that randomly. Um, but a scoring standard goes a long way to, to to help you understand that this is what a call. Uh, flows through like and these are the key parts of it and for each of these key parts this is how you can achieve what we deem to be as a collective good and then this mm. is what happens uh, if you don't you know and, it, and it's it's then very difficult especially when done collaboratively for any single person to kind of say I disagree with that at, at that macro level they may disagree based on particular instances where your QA score in, in a certain direction or your team leaders or whoever score in a certain direction. And then but you listen to the interaction, the customer's gone, that's absolutely fantastic, really appreciate that, well done. But that's because a QA score will not necessarily align with a, with a CSAT score. You know, the, there is generally divergence past the point. You have a fantastic individual um, who scores really well so far along the scorecard because they ask the right questions, they say the right things, they empathise in the right way, and they ascertain what the customer's issue is, and then they tell them they're going to fix it, and then they don't do anything after that. So that customer is going to come back, however many days down the line, and go, this thing I was promised hasn't happened. So there's poor service experience, mm -hmm. but your QA score, if it's snapshots on that scorecard at that point in time, might well say it was awful because you told them all this stuff and then didn't do it, you know? Whereas the customer at that point in time, like, yeah, I had a really, you know, especially when you have the, the post-contact sampling where it's like, um, when you hang up the phone, you'll get a quick, you know, three questions on, on text message, did you, you know, and then it's a standard NPS or whatever it might be. You get that divergence. You can include that in your scoring standards as well, you know, and, and, and really build a, 
a comprehensive document that really supports delivery of, of a balanced scorecard for your business. And I really like something you were talking about then around um, the collective <coughs> growth of your uh, scorecard, because I think the scorecard can be the means by which you have those conversations. And I think I can think back to times where we've delivered the scorecard as part of, I don't know, consultancy or something to senior leaders, and it's the first time they've seen it. And you go, oh, here's your scorecard, and here's where we think there can be some improvements. And they've been like, oh, why are we asking this? I didn't know this, and blah, blah. And, and it, this doesn't align to our um, strategic strategy. And then the flip side of that is, because again, having been there, it, the thought of taking your scorecard up to the senior leadership and just thinking, what are those guys going to come back with? It's going to be some harebrained nonsense. Um, <laughs> We know what we're doing. Let's just keep going. We're doing the right thing, whether it's regulatory or experience based. Um, when in fact, whilst it may be uncomfortable at times, the fact that everyone knows and has contributed to the scorecard, and from a QA point of view, if you're the owners, you are the experts in the room, you can help shape that conversation but you do need to get you you do need to get those senior leadership in for sure now how do you ensure though you don't do the whole uh, a camel is a horse designed by that committee is it just about ensuring the right people are in the room but then you do involve other departments but as a kind of not contributors but viewers yeah, it, I think um, there's, there's two broad ways, isn't it? If you include everyone from everywhere within your business, then you might come up with something fantastic, but takes three years to do it. And is unwieldy and not practical. Yeah, and by the time you've actually built this perfect thing, you, your company's moved on a thousand times, and the people who input it into it may well not be in the business anymore. And you might not sell a different product, have a different name, you know, so... Have, yeah, having that balance of, of who are the most important people to make decisions, um, senior leadership teams need the strategic outcome, absolutely. You know, it, it supports uh, making informed decisions when done well. Quality assurance absolutely supports that. But, yeah, you, you almost have to be able to say no to any single party. Um, again, as a consensus, if you crowdsource your response, and one of the best ways of doing that almost is, is to kind of say, our constraint is we're going to only spend this much time on it. Then we're going to test it. And we're going to, you know, if you're starting from scratch to your point earlier, don't spend too long thinking about the perfect car, build it. You know, these are the key things we need it to do. Yeah. We agree. Cool. Let's go. Let's test it. What's it telling us? Where are the clear areas that we've missed? What are the tweaks that we can do? Go again. You know, because realistically, you're not going to build a perfect scorecard that's going to then live forever. You're going to build something that maybe is going to fit you for the next year or two or until the next large scale strategic change on your objectives. And at that time, you're going to do it again or you're going to run the risk that you become irrelevant to, to supporting the operation. And then you just become a cost center. You don't become something that's adding value. Yeah. And we know, of course, the value that can be added by getting these kind of things right is um, is pretty significant. Um, Peter, we've had a whistle spot tour of the scorecard section of your um, brain. Is there anything you just want to sort of highlight? Um, maybe we haven't touched on it, but should people should consider it and they can contact you um, to follow up more, or we could do another one. Because, like I say, we have just this has been a flyby of the of the brain, <laughs> the random stuff. Yeah, I, I would say um, it's always a question of asking yourself, what outcomes do you want from your scorecard, your scoring standards? Because it is an integral part of of your quality model. Um, 
you've, you've always got to ask yourself that question. When it comes to specifics, there's, there's as many questions as there is, you know, atoms in the universe probably that you could maybe ask yourself around your business that needs to go into it. So if anyone wants to kind of yeah, get in touch and say, these are my specific measurements that I want, and these are my specific outcomes, I'm happy to, as, as always, I love chatting about quality assurance. So if you want to get in touch and just say, what would you conclude? What would you not include? Or what would you do? Or, you know, how, can you help me set it on fire and start again? Absolutely. Peter, Pete Dunn, uh, Quality Engagement Manager for EMEA for BPA Quality, an all-round rock star. Um, thanks very much for... Uh, would you like another one? <laughs> rock star's a good one, isn't it? I do want to point out one final, final thing. I, I, this is chair, by the way, not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the benefits of the T-shirt, mate. But what? That I look even more rotund than I actually am. <laughs> That's one of my favourite words. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pete, thanks very much. Happy belated first birthday to Flynn. Maybe as well as doing up, because we'll do other ones. Uh, but maybe we should always do one round his birthday. Keep it going, absolutely. We can talk about the trials and tribulations of, of my youngest son growing as well. <laughs> well, exactly, because it's always been a, it's always been interesting for me because I'm kind of past those days now. Um, but seeing you go through <laughs> sleep deprivation and the, that and that kind of stuff has, I have to say, in a, it's been entertaining. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Peter. No worries, Thanks, man. everyone. Thank if, if, if you like the content, um, whatever platform you're listening on, um, please do subscribe, rate, all of those, all of those things. Um, and as always, do get in touch. Happy to speak to you about ideas, feedback, um, even the more challenging feedback I, I value. Um, and of course, I can put you in touch with Pete because a little journey through his brain is well worth the time. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.